Jones here dropping in on you and we are continuing uh, our new push to read from four of my most popular books and we've already done Born in Captivity yesterday I'm going to try to close out with that a little later uh, we did Critical Mass earlier this morning right now I'm about to read from chapter one in Academic Apartheid and I initially wanted to do this live like I did Critical Mass, but I'm anticipating a number of interruptions that I might not be in control of, and so I don't want to do that on a live broadcast. Uh, I'll just rather do it here, record it, and then I can edit what I need to edit uh, out those interruptions. So with that being said, I'm going to actually start. And uh, you have to understand, this isn't just a, a a summation of problems in academic America as it pertains to blacks. This is something that's going to go holistically into how we ended up in a situation where we are vulnerable within the academic system and a bunch of other things. So we start out with a chapter one. Chapter one is entitled Fading to Black. To effectively gain a lucid perspicacity of the devastating effects of a people's miseducation, especially when it comes to its youth, we must take a look into the current state of affairs of blacks in America. By examining our present condition, we can we will be able to detect the systemic influence of white supremacy in blacks' lives and culture in this country. As stated earlier, blacks tend to view the activity in the country on an individual basis, limiting their understanding of how the system is operating to maintain its control over them. Racism must be viewed as a system and a bureaucracy in that it, it not only is designed to invade and permeate every orifice of humanity on a global level, but it is also designed to be self-sustaining. What this means is that racism does not only protect the elite and powerful, but it inherently protects itself from being dismantled and rendered ineffective. Racism consistently searches for mechanisms that can be used to further oppress and control those whom it rules over. As we journey through this chapter, we will find that racism has impacted nearly every aspect of our lives. The educational process is simply one of the more complex mechanisms through which it carries out its holistic assault on blacks. Economic castration. Anyone who has followed me for any time understands the passion I have for economic empowerment. The truth is that we as a people cannot truly achieve empowerment and elevation without first achieving collective economic empowerment through, through, the black, through black group economics practiced vertically. A brief examination of African American history reveals that economic impotence has been one of the greatest impediments of true black empowerment. It is economic empowerment that underwrites the vote of blacks as well as their protests. We only need to look at the recent events that have unfolded over the last six months. The killing of young black men by white police officers is alarming. According to a CNN report, young black men are 20, 21 times more likely to be shot and killed by police than are their white counterparts. This only provides a minimal amount of illumination into just how significant this problem is. According to the current numbers, young black men are, are killed by white officers at a rate two of two per week. If consideration is given to other white people in positions of authority or perceived authority, such as security guards and neighborhood watchmen, this number increases to one every 28 hours. This type of killing, these types of killings are sparked, have sparked mass protests across America. However, blacks have experienced very little in the way of justice and reform, further exacerbating the matter. Blacks need to understand that our lack of political influence is directly associated with our economic impotence. Without the financial power to back and underwrite our protests, they become a collective temper tantrum, having no ability to bring about change. With this being said, it is important to understand our history from an economic perspective. At the end of chattel slavery in America, three, uh, the 300,000 quasi-blacks, quasi-free blacks in this country owned one half of 1% of this nation's wealth. Here we are 150 years removed from chattel slavery, and yet we still own roughly uh, around 1% of this nation's aggregate wealth. This is not by accident, it is by design. This is no way for a group of people to compete in a capitalist free enterprise economic system without wealth 
in the form of ownership and control financial assets such as real estate, stocks, and cash reserve. According to Dr. Claude Anderson, one of the brightest minds in the black community, the fact that blacks never received 40 acres and a mule is highly indicative of the causation and the perpetual state of oppression of blacks in America. And Dr. Anderson is one of the greatest champions of African-American uh, economic empowerment. He says blacks are trapped in the lowest level of a real life mon monopoly game. Take a, take a quick look at what else Dr. Anderson has to say about blacks' current economic situation and the historical context uh, that gives meaning to our current situation. In quotation, blacks are America's only non-immigrant group and one of the oldest populations. They have been here since the 1500s and were here before 98% of all immigrant groups arrive, yet blacks are on the bottom of every economic, social, health, and political indicator. End of, parent, uh, end of uh, quotation. It, it, is in, it is this state of economic impotence conjoined with other psychological factors that present the most significant challenge to authentic black empowerment. As we move through this book, you will be introduced to concepts that reveal how economic impotence supports uh, supports black youth miseducation in America. The lack of cultural influence. Because blacks have no economic power, we also lack the capacity to positively impact our culture. Whether you examine the TV shows that pervade our culture or the music in constant rotation, you will find negative messages subliminally inculcated into the black psyche. According to Tom Burrell, author of Brainwash, challenging the myth of black inferiority, it is the propaganda mechanism of mass media that has co consistently perpetuated the negative image of black inferiority and other negative stereotypes associated with being black. Look at what Burrell has to say about propaganda and its influence on black culture. Starting quotation. Propaganda is the outer layer of the brainwashing onion. In the marketing world, propaganda is the first tool of persuasion. Brainwashing is the outcome, but propaganda got us here. It is continued, in it, and its continued use keeps the inferior, superior mind game in play. Instead of using torture or other coercive techniques, the stealthy, media-savvy propagandist uses mass media and other forms of communication to change minds and more ways of thinking. I have no intention of shying away from the term propaganda. I say we use it, take it, take what was thrown at us, shuck it off, and replace it with positive propaganda. End of quotation. As long as we have no economic power, we will lack the ability to influence the black collective, leaving us in a vulnerable state in which we will be affected by the mass messaging machine of white supremacy. The educational systems currently in place and simply uh, mechanisms used to reinforce the existing propaganda I mean, excuse me, existing paradigms of inferiority. We must make a commitment to creating our own systems of mass communication so that we can create and disseminate mass messages with a positive focus directed at our people. It is our responsibility to teach our youth about our rich heritage. Currently, the vast majority of blacks believe slavery is the totality of the African American, of, of African -American history. That very concept is damaging because it the only image of self is that of subjugation and inferiority. The truth is that slavery should be taught in its proper context as an interruption to African history, opening the black mind to the possibility of reclaiming our inherent greatness. Self-hatred. This is a sore subject among blacks, but its forces run deep into the African-American psyche. The consistent barrage of messages that create the image of black inferiority inherently creates the desires of blacks to achieve a certain level of superiority by assimilating into the white image of white supremacy. The, um, excuse me, assimilating into the image of white superiority. This means that blacks have historically sought to change their appearance and position uh, uh, to place themselves in closer relation to their white counterparts, believing that this world somehow improves, this will somehow improve their status. This means that they have brought into the lie that they are inferior. This can be seen in the fact that a significant amount of blacks view naturally curly or kinky hair as being bad hair, while straight hair, which is generally perceived as European feature, is considered good hair. The comparisons are multitudinous, but the end result is the same, self-hatred. 
Blacks spend a great deal of money to attempt to change their appearance to look more European. This is highly indicative of the psychological makeup of blacks in America. The self-image is shaped at the very at a very early age, and it is in these formative years that blacks the black subconscious is riddled with the consistent message of inferiority. It was these types of messages that were necessary to create more docile and subject, uh, subjugated slaves. Understanding this means that we must take the time to rebuild pride in the black self-conscious. This is best done in the early years of a person's life, so the educational process through which our kids are informed of self is essential. We cannot expect white America to educate our children properly. That is our responsibility. We must introduce our children to their true heritage and history so that they can develop healthy self-esteem and health and a healthy self-image, eliminating the devastating force of self-hatred. The disintegration of the black family nucleus. This topic deserves its own volume, and I plan to dedicate myself to producing one in the near future. However, it is worth at least placing the cards on the table. I have stated this more than, uh, on more than one occasion, and I will endeavor to present it once more. A race of people, as a race of people, blacks will only ascend as high as our women can spiritually elevate us, and we will only go as far as our men can physically lead us. Here's the problem. We were designed to function as a nuclear unit. It is through the family that information is initially disseminated and core beliefs are formed. It is the family that is the nucleus of civil civilization, one of the four prominent institutions in any form of civil and social culture. Since we arrived on this continent more than 400 years ago, there has been an all-out assault against the black family. Because slaves were considered property, they had no legal right to marry, and even the makeshift weddings that they participated in had no power to protect them from being split up and sold away from one another by their masters. In fact, slaves were systematically bred and separated to keep them from formulating family bonds that would inherently provide them with integral strength and direction. The psychological scars that were suffered during slavery follow, follow the black man and the black woman into their physical freedom, ensuring that they, they remained bound psychologically. And just when blacks began to develop some sense of filial responsibility and commitment, white supremacy racism introduced the feminist movement into the black community. This served to further exacerbate existing issues while creating new ones. The lack of upward mobility in the black community is inextricably bound to the multi-generational poverty and the destruction of the black nuclear family. Again, one of the best ways to address this issue is early in the developmental stages of a black child's life. Religion as an educational mechanism. Religion has been one of the most effective tools used by white supremacy to assist in the process of subjugation. Actually, the use of religion to condition and control the minds of conquered people is nothing new. Throughout history, conquering nations have used the cultural, their cultural religion as a method of brainwashing and conditioning those whom they have conquered. When it comes to Christianity, the primary mode of religious conditioning in America, especially when it comes to Americans of African descent, it is somewhat ironic. This is due to the fact that one of the primary themes of the Bible, the, or the authoritative source of Christianity, is the, the conquering and subjugation of the Israelites as a form of punishment for turning away from God. One specific area in which this is presented in lucid fashion is in the book of Daniel. To provide a brief synopsis of the story, over the course of three separate invasions in, uh, of Jerusalem, King Nebuchadnezzar and his Chaldean military besieged Jerusalem. The first time was in 605 BC during the first invasion. Nebuchadnezzar allowed Jehoiakim Je to remain on the throne as a vassal king. It was in the time that Daniel um, and Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, most more, more uh, effectively known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, their given names were taken captive and uh, taken back to Babylon. This entire book is replete with stories in which either Daniel or the other three Hebrew boys had to resist the religious tenets of the Chaldean culture. I know that there are some who are wondering who are the Chaldeans. Most people view them as Babylonians. However, the new empire established by Nebuchadnezzar Nebuchadnezzar, the father of Nebuchadnezzar, established the Chaldean Empire when, the, when they conquered the Assyrians in Babylon. 
In chapter 1 of the story of the kings, the king orders that young boys be fed the delicacies of the royal family. However, the boys realized that this was a part of the brainwashing process, and they subsequently convinced their overseer to allow them to have a vegetarian diet. The next time there was an issue was in chapter 3, when everyone was ordered to bow down and worship the new image of Nebuchadnezzar had built. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused and were sentenced to be cast into the fire which they survived. I'm not here to defend the story, uh, only to point out the psychological implications. Later in the book, Daniel would insist on praying during a time when prayer was banned and he was cast into the den of lions, a fate he also survived. What is to be understood here is the fact that by resisting to conform to the religious tenets of their captors, these young boys were able to maintain their sense of identity. When, when a conquered people assume the religion of their conquerors, they will become confused as to their own identity and self-worth. Religions are built around the cultures of the people who create them, and they are not meant to support the alien psyche of a conquered people. What cannot go unnoticed in all of this is that at the same time that the conquering is forcing his the conqueror is forcing his religion upon those that have been conquered, he is also outlawing the practice of their na their native religion. Understanding the psycholo uh, psychology behind this provides the foundation for gaining a lucid apprehension of how white supremacy has used Christianity as one of its most powerful weapons against African Americans. Not only does the relinquishment of our native uh, spirituality come at the price of surrendering a substitutional amount of our spiritual assets in exchange for an emotional experience, but it also introduces an inferiority complex. It is impossible for a group of people to maintain a positive and healthy image, self-image, when the religion that they practice presents God that does not, a God that does not look like them, but is identical to their captors. Although the largest portion of this book is centered on the African American, uh, on the American education system, it is paramount for blacks to understand that there are many methodologies being used to miseducate our people, and we must successfully engage each and every one of them. That was chapter one. Look, I hope that, you know, this really turns out to be what I anticipated and what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping to open up discussion. I'm hoping for people to literally come in and leave their uh, contributions and their insights and sharing. I want to open up these discussions because inside these tenets and these ideas are the solutions to the problems of our people. And that's my goal. So with that being uh, in mind, I'm going to go ahead and leave this here. Again, don't forget to show some love and support for the work we do at the Odyssey Project. Go to the description box and show some love through your contributions. On that note, I'm out of here. You guys have an unbelievable day. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Dr. Rick Wallace here dropping in. I will not be before you long, but what I do need to reinforce and reiterate with uh, great uh, specificity is the fact that if we ever needed your support here at the Odyssey Project, we need it now. Uh, there are so many different battles going on on so many different fronts, but one of the things that I'm immensely pa passionate about and can uh, never successfully overlook or sidestep around is the failure uh, of protecting and covering our children, preparing our children, educating our children, giving our children a fighting chance in this world. There are constant headlines of our children dying uh, at the hands of those who are supposed to protect them, at the hands of law enforcement, or becoming incarcerated uh, because of a failure to be prepared and so many other things that we are going to have to be responsible for. We can no longer be uh, satisfied with sitting idly by and going, oh my God, shaking my head. That's sad. That's a shame. We're going to have to become actively involved in being a part of the change, being a part of 
empowering our youth. So at this moment, I am calling out and I'm asking you uh, to support the work we do at the Odyssey Project. You will always be able to find a way to do so by looking in the description box at the top of the description box of any video on the Black Voice channel and any other platform where you see videos concerning black issues. You will see how you can support us by either clicking a link or giving directly through the organization's Cash App account. Again, this is a time in which we really need to step forward. So again, I'm asking, step forth and show some love and show some support.